Cool, excited to, to have everybody here. Uh, we're, we're doing another round table here with the crew. Uh, we, have, we have Chris here with us. Chris, you want to tell us a little bit about you and, and, and why you're here and, and tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. Um, Chris Holmes. Um, I grew up in a town just east of here called Heber City. Um, yeah, why I'm here, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, gonna, find, we're gonna find that out. Um, made an app, so I'm sure it's something to do with that. But yeah. Um, yeah, grew up playing basketball, riding horses, you know, just typical thing. Um, typical Heber City. Typical Heber City thing, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it is great, but been, been working at a company called Vivint for a long time, doing door-to-door -door sales and now we're at a, a solar company. Um, yeah, things are good. So, so your background is not in development. It's mostly sales, would you say? Yeah, yeah. I'd say it's not my natural thing that I do is selling. I'm not. I don't like selling people on something. That, you know, it just has this negative connotation. It just wasn't what I thought I would ever do. But do you want to borrow my flat bill hat? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, it ended up being a really good career. Um, I enjoyed it a lot and yeah, provide a lot of opportunities for me. So cool. Awesome. So, so let's talk about your guys' relationship. Let's talk about how it kind of started, right? Yeah. So I, I met Austin when I started making the app. Um, I was starting with a couple of companies and, um, you know, Austin was one of them and they were kind of merging to figure this thing out. And so, uh, when, when it was going back and forth, I really liked more of how Austin ran things. Uh, he's very upfront with things, pricing, timelines. Doesn't really jerk you around on things. Yeah, Proper just, expectations. Just expectations were right. And so when we kind of finished up what we had agreed to do at that portion, I just, I pulled him aside and said, I, I want to keep doing this. Uh, I'd like to do it with you solely, right? And so um, that's it. That's mm -hmm. kind of how we met. And that's like a super funny thing because I, I literally talk with people every single day and, it, and they do exactly what you did. They kind of go and shop around, they get all these different quotes. And it's super funny because um, people come and say, hey, you know, this company quoted me 15,000, 20,000. I'm like, there's no chance that you're gonna get even half of what you expect paying that much. And yeah, I, I've had people come up to me and, and that my brother is one of them. And I've had people come up and say, I'm. I'm getting an app built and they're saying they can do it for ten, fifteen thousand dollars and they basically have it built and he showed me and I'm like, this is a wireframe. Mm. Like you, you you paid fifteen grand for a wireframe, which yeah. isn't crazy, but that's what you have. That's not that's not an app. Like they can't just copy these images and put it into an app form and all of a sudden it's it's interactive. It's working. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> it's it's just a really and I don't know why the industry does that. Again, I think people get really shocked and are turned off to make an app when they hear, hey, this is gonna be 80 to 100. Mm -hmm. They're like, uh, no, right? But I think they kind of know if I can get someone to cough up 10, 15, 20, they're in balls deep already. They're gonna spend another 20 if they have to. Like, so, you know what I mean? They'd rather spend 20 than lose 20. That's literally the, exp like, and it's so, and I'm trying like super hard and we've put a bunch of processes in place to try and clear that up. And it's like, we're trying to teach people that you've got to make like a little investment up front right now. Um, and this is kind of like a side tangent in order to figure out what the scope of the project really is and how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's usually a lot more than people expect. And so that's really one thing that we at Strides are trying to change in the industry. Sure because it, it sucks. I literally talk to people every day, 15 grand, 20 grand you're gonna have it. I'm like, no, you're, you're gonna pay 50 to 100. They're just getting you in the door. You're gonna come back to me later because I was straight with you, but then- like, you're gonna have $15,000 <laughs> less. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's just, it's super weird and we're really trying to change that. And what I wanna get into now is like, why did you build Equine Trader? Like, what did you see in the market? What time out, time out. We actually haven't talked about the app yet. So, so let's first talk about Equine Trader. Is cool. that okay? Yeah, that's fine. So let's, let's, let's go there, Chris. First, let's talk about what Equine Trader is. Let's talk about that and what sparked the idea. And then let's go into kind of that, if that's okay. Just because we haven't talked about Equine Trader. So tell us about your idea and kind of how you got it. Yeah, I mean, Equine Trader is essentially just what it sounds like. It's a it's a trading platform for, for horses. 
like just simply put, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, what sparked the idea is I was trying, I, I have horses, so I grew up riding horses, training horses, owning. Horses is one of those things that you, you rarely find people that kind of like them. Like it's either I am so in love with horses and I can't get it out of my blood or I got on a horse when I was 12 and got bucked off and I'll never walk by one again. Like <laughs> it's, it's one of the two. It's never like, yeah, they're cool. You, you know, it's, it's like, no, I love horses or no, I don't ride horses. Like it's one of the two. It's really passionate. Yeah. It's, it, it, I don't know what it is, but they have this way of kind of getting under your skin. So um, yeah, I grew up riding horses, love horses, um, and I was breeding them, raising them, and I was going to sell one and just realized there's no place to sell a horse. Like it was really, it was really awkward. Uh, you know, the, the places that you could sell them were these, the only options, literally the only options were like a, a website that was only desktop driven, it wasn't on a phone, uh, and you had to pay a good amount of money to list them on this website. And the biggest ones that I saw were like 200 horses were on there, sold and still actively. Oh, so it was a small number. 200 total, mm -hmm. and that was like the biggest ones. The more popular route, and the, the way I ended up selling my horse was posting it on Facebook. Like the Facebook has these groups, which is awesome. Uh, the problem with Facebook was that a lot of tire kickers, because on Facebook you cannot post prices of any animals. They, it just, yep. you start, if you put a price on an animal for sell, Facebook Remember. shuts it down like almost instantaneous. So hmm. um, it was, you were getting a lot of inquiries like, what's the price? And you know, in, if anyone that knows horses, there's big ranges of what horses cost. Yep. Uh, like my wife grew up doing 4-H and just little rodeos around her small town. And, you know, uh, most people pay 500 to $2,000 for a horse. $10,000 is like Astronomical. A, a really, really good horse, yep. you know. And for a lot of people, it's a lot of money. It is for me. It's, it's just a lot of money. But in some disciplines, like in reining, a ten thousand dollar horse is kind of like entry level. It's entry and kind of like a horse that didn't make it and is not good. Yeah. Like is a ten thousand dollar horse. You, you know, it's it's still a good horse, but not it's not going to compete at any level that's competitive, right? So, yeah. all the way up to seventy, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars for mm -hmm. for a horse, right? Which, if you think about, it, it's pretty crazy. But it's one of those things again. If it's in your blood. It, you just can't get it out. So, um, you, anyways, listing a horse on there, the one that I was selling was not the high end, not the low end, but it was a good amount of money. But can you give people a perspective on what's considered low end and high end in a lot of what we see in Equine Trader now? Yeah, so, um, well, we, we have the option of someone saying call for price if they don't want to list the price. Typically, the call for price horses are a lot more money, yeah. right? They, north of a hundred mm -hmm. is, is those hundred thousand dollars. So, but we'll see horses a hundred, like the, the, I don't know, I'd say the range of horses that are listed between 60,000 and a hundred is, is a good amount Pretty in, high. in raining. High end. Yeah. So, and I can see the issue you're saying on Facebook, someone may have a thousand to two thousand dollar budget they see your horse you're getting inquiries about your seventy thousand yeah. dollar horse from the thousand dollar budget people yeah. constantly. because there's a disconnect right yeah and so it's it <clears throat> kind of got annoying like it was like <laughs> i'm not gonna respond to you unless you hit me up three times or yeah. something you know it mm -hmm. just it got really overwhelming and and then i was looking at buying a horse kind of the same time and it was like how do how do i find a horse really the only way, it's just so old school, like the horse industry was so old school, something had to be disrupted in that space and no one had just done it. Mm -hmm. But the best way to find horses before Equine Trader was again, these Facebook groups, but not, the, so kind of let me back up as well. The, the issue with Facebook groups as well, when I was looking at buying, 
is if you saw one that you liked in a group, you can't search for that horse in Facebook group. Like mm. uh, it just uh, goes down the list as more people, it's like further down. And then obviously if someone comments, it kind of goes up and like- So you could lose it. So unless you really share quick. it with somebody specifically or save the link, you're not finding Yeah, it. you lose it fast, mm -hmm. like really fast. You can't like, if I was looking for, you know, like a buckskin gilding that I wanted, I can't search, show me all the buckskin gildings that are listed for sale in this group or mm -hmm. anywhere, yeah. not just in this group, literally anywhere, right? So it just made it really hard to find what yeah. you're, what you're so, doing. So you basically saw a huge miss in the market and said, listen, there's an opportunity. I need to make something better. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was just that. Right. So when you noticed that there was like this problem in the market, how much work did you actually put in to see if there, like if a solution would actually be like demanded by the market? Because there's this interesting phase like in a lot of apps now where like really what we're pushing for is to not just go, you know, start designing and pushing a product out, but to really start actually doing research, trying to find apps. Tell me what that looked like. Were you mainly talking with friends and family? Was it yeah. bigger people? I mean, I. I've been in the industry for a while, so I kind of knew like you were the target. This market. this would be, yeah. This this is wanted. It's mm -hmm. needed. It's just never been done. Um, again, sorry. I I kind of want to go back real quick because I think I started saying the only way to find a horse, the best way to find a horse before was you would have to know ranchers or trainers mm -hmm. or people that have horses for sale, and you literally call them. Because most of them like to call. It's just old school ranching people. <laughs> yeah, they like, have the little. <laughs> yeah, like it's so you call them and say, "Hey, do you have any two-year-olds for sale within this budget?" It's like, "Yeah, I think I do. I might have this one. I haven't put a video up on online yet, which is just like YouTube or something, or <laughs> yeah. on their on their their own personal website. Um, I'll send you a video, and you get one maybe two weeks later." And, you if know what I mean? like that was the way to find horses and so that are auctions right like, yeah I, auctions, auctions are pretty common yeah auctions are very common they do they do very well uh -huh. yeah. so but you have to go and you have to make a decision on spot by seeing it right then and there yeah the problem with auctions is you don't you get as much info as they're telling you but mm -hmm. if anyone's bought anything at an auction i have it's like you kind of get this endorphin rush and it's mm -hmm. more of like an emotion go 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 and then you <laughs> buy it you're like Oh crap! Like, did, I, did I just I did, did I bring a trailer? Like my budget was ten, and I just paid twenty. Like <laughs> I, I don't know what I just did. What just yeah. Happened? So and then same thing happens in golf. So yeah. So <laughs> it's yeah. I, I definitely saw a need, but then so kind of my back. My my dad was heavily involved in reining horses, and mm -hmm. we trained with some of the best reining trainers on earth, like Todd mm -hmm. Bergen, Andrea Fapani, and you know, we, we knew these people, Brett Stone. And so I had relationships with them from, luckily from my dad, when my dad was riding with them. And then it kind of evolved to where I started meeting them and knowing So you were, them. you were in the market, you were in the network of people. Yeah. They, I this. know them from when I was a kid training and riding with them, you know? So, um, so what I did is I, it was, I kind of hit the road. Uh, it was, it was during the, not during the pandemic, was it? it was, yeah, it was like a little bit before. Just right, like right when we launched. But so I, I literally hit the road and drove to these ranches and just said, "Hey, I had a wireframe idea, no app, and just said, "Hey, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that I'm going to launch this. It's going to work very similar to like, you know, Auto Trader or, or one of those car platforms or Zillow mm -hmm. for homes." And this is what it'll look like. Um, do you think it would be used? And not like most, the overwhelming, every single person was like, 100% I would use that. Mm -hmm. Like not even a question. Like really? of course I would use it. Why? Mm -hmm. There's no reason not to. And the only, the only reason people might not is just anything when you, if you had to pay for the app or, mm -hmm. or list a horse, like, I think people, I, I ended up going the route of not having people pay to list a horse. And mm -hmm. I think it's because so many people had negative experiences listing them on these websites. Yeah. And it was like, let's get that yeah, like, out of the way. Yeah. So 
but it was everyone, not one person said that won't work. And yeah. even people out of the horse industry, I'm like, okay, I know, you know, 20 of the top professionals in the world and owners and they are saying a hundred percent I would use this, but I was just curious, like, what would someone that's not involved in horses think of this? Like they know horses, but to the extent they know they're a real thing, but that, that's it. <laughs> that's I'm it. like, Hey, if I did this and they, they, all of them were like, that's got to exist right now. Like that has to. <laughs> so, so their response that, was surprised. That was literally me. When you walked in the room and like pitched this, I had like, you know, about horses. I have no idea. I learned, I didn't know what gelding and like yeah. all this yeah. random shit was. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, who would use this? Like, why is this important? How are you going to get to market? Like, what are you going to yeah. do? And it was, so it, it was, that was the extent of my market research. It was just like, I know the top people in this industry and across different disciplines. When I say industry, I mean discipline, reigning mm -hmm. discipline, right? Yeah. So reigning is pretty well respected as a, as a good discipline in horses, but yeah. it's pretty small compared yeah, it's, it's, to it's other niche, ones. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really big if you're in that world, but yes. if you look at it compared to like the barrel or the roping or yeah any of these cutting, rodeo, like, any of those, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's smaller compared to those. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I knew it was a good idea. How good of an idea? I didn't, I didn't True. know. Um, but, but you did that validation, like literally you hit the road and you saw, okay, there's a couple different markets here. You had your professionals, the, the high end mm -hmm. people. And then you also had the people you didn't like, and that's something our listeners just need to know is like, you need to somehow get this validation in here before you go and dump 80 to hundred thousand dollars in a new product. You really need to understand it. Well, Listen, is this going to be used? Yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone, I mean, probably a lot of people that are honest with themselves do, but most people, if they come up, if they literally come up with an idea themselves, rarely think it's a bad idea. Yeah. Nobody mm -hmm. thinks yeah, some baby's exactly. ugly. No. So it's just like, <laughs> this is a good idea. So a yeah. lot of people have, you know, confirmation bias of, of like for myself i think this is a good idea my wife does yeah your but, friends and family aren't gonna tell your baby's ugly either yeah so, so it really comes down to that so that helped uh, and i knew if it was getting this big of a response just in this discipline it it's gonna go in all the other ones. it'll it's easily translated to all the other disciplines yep. it's not like yeah the horses are different different breeding, but they're still breeding. There's still people buying yep. them and selling mm -hmm. them like that doesn't and, and I would say that even in the horse world, they can translate. Like if you have a good reigning horse, it actually turns into a pretty good calf. Horse. There's a lot of them like, that, that <laughs> do. There's some that don't. Right. Yeah. But I, I think that's why most people do like reigning because you, at the end, the finished product is a very, very broke horse. Yep. And mm -hmm. it's yep. a lot of that blood is in, is in, cow horse a lot yep. of it is in roping people ropers love reining yep. horses because they stop big and especially so, calf roping <laughs> yeah they, <laughs> they do translate reading. but there's some that don't like yep. you know you'll have like ranch horses that can't do reining not because they're yep. stupid horses it's just, it's just because they've been ranching their whole life yep. that's what they are and they're genetically not yep. bred to well i mean that. even even my parents they would go you know race horses retire at what three years old sometimes three or four years old. Sure. And so we would go and we'd buy race horses and turn them into barrel racing horses, right? So there, there is that bleed of different things. So it's kind of interesting that you, that you went to multiple areas and said, Hey, listen, this is, this is an idea. And they all told you it was a good idea. I'm curious about Austin. When, when he came to you with this idea, what was your first impression? I know you kind of talk, talked on a little bit, but just kind of like, tell me as a developer, how your mind went from there. Well, and it's, I, I think I think a little bit differently than like most developers. Cause I'm more thinking of all, on like a business development side, like how are we going to get this out there? Like what kind of people are going to use it? How are we like, going to get people to download <laughs> yeah. this? Right? Yeah. And at first, like I looked at it, I'm like, this is weird. Like, and I remember even talking with you, I was like, this seems archaic. This seems like, you know, 2008. Yeah. But if we actually look at like all of the, again, the support emails that we see, it's like, we have basically taken it to its simplest form. We identified like how old the people are that are typically using this and what's there is working. And we still, I mean, we still get questions on like, how do we do specific things? Sure. But that was one hard thing for me because I, I wanted to push for a super modern approach. Mm -hmm. um, but because you were so familiar with the market, you're able to push back, which yeah. a lot of people 
aren't. They're yeah. not gonna push back. Most dev people that I had talked to, they're like, are you sure this will work? And I'm like, yeah. I know it'll work. To the extent of what it'll work, obviously no one really knows, yeah. but mm -hmm. I know it's an idea that is, is needed. You know, yep. people want this. And so, yeah, I mean, but before that, it just, it really struck me. I'm like, how in the world am I able to go on an app on my phone and if I want to find a house, I can go to Zillow <laughs> and literally filter it down to like the exact square footage, exact acreage, exact bedroom numbers, uh -huh. like. Or an exact car. <laughs> yeah. Right? Car. I can find a 2015 F-150 EcoBoost just like that, right? Right. And With less see, than 20,000 miles. Yeah. And, and 30 seconds. Within 100 miles of me. Yeah. Within any distance within 500, like, so in horses, it just wasn't a thing. So that, I mean, that's what the app is. You can go on there and just say, I want to find all the, you know, yearling to five-year-old gildings and mares that are either Bay, Sorrel, mm -hmm. Palomino that are within this distance. Oh yeah. And they have to be carrying a baby right now from one of these sires mm -hmm. and they had to have won this much money. Like in the horse world before this, I mean, that was just, it wasn't possible. Like no one even thought it was possible. Like it just wasn't a thing. So yeah, yeah and I wanted to make something cause I knew it would be good for buyers. I knew what buyers were wanting, but I didn't want to just create a product that was good for one side of the transaction or whatever it is. Yeah. I wanted one that both, the sellers would love to have that option. And well, it, and I mean, you yourself was a buyer and a seller. Yeah. And when I went and visited, you know, Todd Bergen, who's, who's a good friend, um, he lives up in Oregon. So most horse people will live in like Texas or Arizona for a number of reasons. But that's like, if you're in the horse industry, that's kind of the two places where, where people go. I think a lot of it as well that, you know, if you're in Utah and you want to ride year round, you have to have an indoor arena and indoors are way more expensive than outdoors or just covered outdoor arenas. Or you're driving mesquite. Cattle's better pricing, like feed is cheaper and those like, so there's a number of reasons, but, um, but Todd, he moved to Arizona or I'm sorry, up Oregon. to Oregon. And when I drove up there and talked to him about it, he's like, I'm like, I know, you know, you might use it or, but do you think just random ranchers, cause they live in like a ranching area. Yeah would use it. And he's like, that would be probably better for them than, than me. Like mm -hmm. I have customers call me all the time wanting to buy a horse, but you know, Bob down the road, that he doesn't have the exposure. He, mm -hmm. How is he going to, so it, it basically leveled the playing field as far mm -hmm. as if you're a breeder, big time breeder and have lots of horses, or if you're Bob and you only have one horse that you want to sell, you can list at the same place and get it out to the same number of people as this, big time breeder or trainer, right? So it made it really nice immediately, these people that are trying to sell one horse. And I mean, Bob up in Oregon, if he's just trying to sell one, he's, his options are, you know, limited to who he's, he is going to contact his circle of friends that he would, hey, do you know anyone that wants to buy this? So it was really good for sellers and then obviously buyers. It just was like, yeah. obviously amazing win for him. Mm -hmm. And what I kind of want to do is I kind of want to jump more into like the development of it and like the specific features and kind of talk about your experience because I think you've seen a wide variety of different ways to do things. And I'm guessing you could probably give a lot of these new people that are building these apps some red flags to look for um, and also explain some things that you would maybe even do differently and, you know, advise other people to do differently when building like these bigger apps. Yeah. Um... I think there is a good answer to it. Maybe, maybe help me yeah. understand so, like an example, what you're kind of referring to. Yeah. So what I actually want to do is let's kind of jump into like the specific features. So first, how did you as a founder decide like which features were the most important to put in your app and which ones you had to build later on? And how did you go about making those decisions? Yeah, I think for me, probably different because I was, I built it out of, frustration of being an actual customer that would have used it. So yeah. what would I want? You know, like this is all the things that I would want. And there's, there's some in there that I didn't know people would want, but it, it came, it grows. So like when we launched everything, location was not an option. I yeah. couldn't filter by location. Um, height wasn't a big one mm -hmm. because I personally 
don't care the size of a reining horse that I'm riding. Yeah, like, but, but a calf or a team roping horse. Team roping know. do, yeah. uh, but even a lot of people that do reining do yeah. care. Like huh. if, if they're a, you know, a six, five guy and I'm tall, I'm six, but again, I just didn't care. They kind of wanted a little bit bigger horse or j just different things. But out of reining height was a really big deal. Like mm -hmm. height was, and just in reining it wasn't. So I, I never thought of it. Um, also, I know I, we did put color in there initially, but I don't care of the color of my horse. And most trainers could care less what the color of the horse is. The owners really, really care, right? And so mm -hmm. um, if it was just what I would, I wouldn't care about color. But I think it's that color is probably one of the more commonly used filters on the app. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, you, and the people kind of decided that. Because yeah. you originally didn't. Right. Really sorry. It that's, that's kind of what, sorry, I forgot what I was getting at. But. It, it evolves. We launched it and then I didn't just stop asking people their opinion. Like I was still hitting the road and talking to people and they're like, you know what? And obviously people would just freely give their opinion even if I didn't ask for it. Like, <laughs> hey, you need to do this. Like, <laughs> add this. I would say that probably happened more often. <laughs> yeah, add this, you know? And so height was one. It's like, hey, I, I need a place to add height on here yeah. or I need a place to have a link for a video because it, we have these long videos that we want on there, but you know, we can't list them on there because there's only so much room on the app that someone can have on there. So yeah. just a number of things. And so it, it evolved. Like I started, we launched it knowing we're going to change things. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's kind of what we did. And I, and I think that's a super important thing is like you, you didn't feel like you had to go to market with all of the bells and whistles. We wanted a stable product. And you also understood that it was going to evolve over time. I think a lot of founders, because like, they, they don't want their baby to be called ugly, they try and get the most perfect thing in the entire world, keep iterating, keep iterating, and then launch two years later or don't launch it. Yeah. All. I mean, you can, you know, paralysis by analysis is a real thing. Yep. Like, I, you could have, I could have easily sat there and just gone over and over it again, but it, but also you want it out to people using it because that's when you're going to get the best feedback. Yep. If, if I'm only asking, you know, 10 people their feedback and I'm looking at it every day, eventually you stop seeing things. You got to have fresh eyes on stuff. Like yep. someone that's never even seen this before, show it to them. I'm, that happened a lot. Like I thought it was done and we're, we're good. And I showed it to one person and they're like, Hey, why don't, why don't you have this on there? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, and they see it immediately. And I, I looked at it for hours and I never saw it. And it's, it's that lean startup mentality, right? Is letting the people who are going to use it kind of mold the, the product, which is one of the reasons why we, we push really heavily in our, in all of our new projects is that validation feature. Let the people tell us what features are most important. And early on you can find out, you know what, I need to know how many hands this horse is, you know, or, or I'm really important on the color and things like that. And so finding out and continuing to do that market research, even after you launch is huge. Yeah. Um, one thing that was super interesting about you is I remember saying, you know, we need to have like a good go to market strategy. I remember bringing you in a room with, you know, a, a good marketing team member or whatever. And we were talking about things like running Facebook ads, trying to get, um, that way we could raise awareness for ranchers and raise awareness for buyers as well. But you were like dead set on not doing any of that. Kind of explain like your reasoning as to why you would push so hard against, you know, pre-marketing, whereas a lot of other companies would have to do that. Yeah. So I don't, it wasn't that I thought it was a bad idea. I knew it's valuable. I, mm -hmm. I knew it's a thing that works. So it wasn't that it, I didn't like it. I didn't think it was necessary at the time because I had this really rare scenario where mm -hmm. I was, I'm, I'm friends with some of the best trainers in the world. Mm -hmm. Like anyone like, yeah, some of the best in the world. So, not that we're like best friends and we hang out, but yeah. I, I knew them and they knew me. So I, I just knew that if I can get these people to start doing, it's kind of like launching a product, um, like a new, a new, uh, sports wear and something. And somehow for basketball mm -hmm. and somehow I, I know LeBron, mm -hmm. I, I know Kobe, I know, I know all these players. Right. And I already talked to them and I knew if, I could get them to use it and they like it. So if I can get LeBron and Kobe, all of these guys to start wearing my stuff, yep. I, I think it's important to have that, but that's not, I had a better way. Yep. I just had a better route to market. And so 
it, it was rare. I don't think that's a normal thing. No, and, it, and that's really what it is. You were so familiar with your industry that you were able to make decisions. Yeah. Like, and, and that's huge. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think down the road that I'm gonna have that. Again, yep. it's, not a, it's not bad ideas. It was just, I knew I had a better route to market, mm -hmm. at least for raining. So we were talking about this before we started this, but you know, there's not an unlimited, but there are tons of different disciplines for horses. Yeah. Uh, and so you have raining, you have barrel, cow horse, roping, I mean, racing, there, there's a lot, you know? And so um, I really haven't done any marketing for anything other than raining. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's what's encouraging for me as a founder, like, so hey, it went, it went good. And like, it's, it's pretty popular now in yeah. raining in less than a year. Um, I can easily translate that over, but it, yeah, I just, I was in a rare situation where. But I mean, less than a year, like just to throw some numbers out there for everybody, no marketing. You, I think you have over 15,000 Facebook followers in your community. Yeah. You have you know, about 10 horses selling every single day. You have 800 people that- like 10 being posted every day as well. Yeah, right? you have 10 new horses getting listed every day. You have 800 people getting on the app every single day, equating to like 250 searches. So it's like for zero marketing on your end, like that's pretty crazy. And again, I think it shows the importance, like if you can get no, into a market, market, know it and find a niche, mm -hmm. like, you're going to, it's going to be way easier to break in than trying to build the next Facebook or sure. Google or whatever else. Yeah, I think TikTok. taking TikTok, <laughs> taking examples from them of why was it successful yep. is, is something that I, I leaned on. So I, I talked about it at the beginning, but we decided not to charge people to list horses because yep. I think they had a bad experience. And also people don't want to pay for something if they don't know it's going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, the kind of the, you know, if you are looking at Facebook or any of these really, really popular um, apps, it was, why are they so popular? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why do I have Facebook? If I had to pay, if I, if I'd never used Facebook ever before and I had to pay to use Facebook, I don't know if I would have done it initially, mm -hmm. you know? So their, their concept was create a platform that is is really, really popular. Don't create any barriers to entry on this. Mm -hmm. Get get the platform, and then once you have the platform, now you can decide, how do I want to monetize this? Yep. Uh, you Premium know. listings. Or yeah, uh, have people start, because if, if people are successful on it, you know, like you said, we're selling eight to 10 horses a day on the app, which is frustrating to me, because we have 10 to 12 horses being listed a day, <laughs> so it's, it's good, and that's, mo again, mostly all in raining. Uh, and so it's good, but the overall number isn't changing Increasing. drastically, and it <laughs> bugs the crap out of me. But um, yeah, it, it kind of for what you just said, like there's this many people using it daily. There's this many, I don't know how many 20, 30,000 downloads. Like it's, yeah. that seems so small to me. Like, you know, 800 to 1,000 people getting on every day. I'm like, that's... That sucks. Yeah. You know, I'm not happy with that at all. Yeah. And that's not popular enough in my marine at, yeah. at all. Right. Yep. So, um, yeah, we chose to completely eliminate all the barriers to entry. And then down the road, I think what we're going to do is either start charging people to mm -hmm. list, but I kind of like the idea of, of advertising, right? Mm -hmm. Selling advertising slots on there. Cause if it's a big enough platform and there's X number of people getting on, every day, every week, every month, um, that's a lot easier to sell advertising spots than it is just to charge people mm -hmm. 20 bucks to list a horse, right? So, yeah. and, and then you keep it to where people still like it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they don't like having things changed up on them. Like mm -hmm. it's free, free, all of a sudden now it's not. It's like, yep. so we're, we're still tossing that idea around, but I think the more logical one is the advertising. Yeah, advertising or premium, premium pushes. Yeah, pushing your things. Um, interesting. No, that, and I think that's super useful. I, I kind of wanted to jump a little bit, Austin, into more of the technical things and some of the some of the things you foresaw 
was going to be a big issue, and then things that really were issues and challenges. You know, it's super funny to talk about this because this was one of the first projects that I started um, and took from zero to complete, and so there were a lot of things that we did wrong. <laughs> we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a lot of things we did wrong, and, and I was able to learn a ton from it. Um, Which was cool because I paid for those mistakes. <laughs> no, it, it was awesome. There's, I literally tell there's people not, there's not free mistakes. <laughs> oh, it, it, I think that's super funny. I mean, I literally say this all the time. It's like if somebody's gonna, you know, lose money, it's better they lose money on me than on somebody else. <laughs> <Just> kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. Um, oh but it, but there were a lot of like places for us to learn and make things better. And I, I think in the end, we ended up making things right for you to yeah. to make sure you had a good experience overall. Um, but I would say the the hardest things, uh, or really the biggest mistake that we made was not really understanding how complex uh, searches needed to be and how robust they needed to be and how performant they needed to be. Um, and that was a huge pain. So that was one of the biggest roadblocks. It's just the complex amount of the searches, sires, yeah. size. Yeah. But I will say the one thing that we did do right is I was able to build it in a way where we were able to like rebuild the entire like back end infrastructure in like a week and had it up and running. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we did a lot of things wrong, but we were able to figure out all of like the key things to know how the searching group was supposed to work. And it was built, you know, abstract enough to where we were able to pull in, um, you know, a, a relational database to help perform those queries. Yeah, so, I, I'd say, I think what we did right was we built it with the long-term goal in mind, not like what's the short-term best thing right now. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, it's like, we wanna build this for what's good now, but let, let's lean our ladder up against the wall that is taking us to where we wanna go, not just a short-term fix. Yep. Cause you know, in apps, if you, if you completely revamp, you build it for a short-term, once you hit there, You're then stunned. it's like, you can't just like copy and paste that over and then just do it right from there on. It's mm -hmm. like, you, you had to, you'd have to redo the whole thing, yeah. right? And that was just something I wasn't willing to take. And so, um, but yeah, it was, I, I joking, free, free, no free mistakes, but <laughs> it, it was fine with me because it was above the board. Like yeah. it wasn't like, hey, we just have to do this. It's, it's like, no, we, we did this wrong. Um, this is what we're gonna do to make it right with you, but this is how we're gonna do it moving forward. And this is how much it's gonna cost, right? So. Yep. I just, I think the trust level was just high enough to where I knew I wasn't being screwed. Mm. Like, I think that's what most people want. Like, yeah. if I they, remember even calling you one day and be like, Chris, like, I need you to trust me. Yeah. <laughs> like kind of conversations, like, it's like, as long as we have this trust, like we are going to take your product where it needs to go. But I just need to know that like, you believe fully in what we're doing and we just need to make sure we're on the same page and completely transparent with each other. Yeah. Which you didn't have that in the past. Right. And that's, that was something that was, and, and I think a lot of people are in that same situation. They'll go to different firms, like for example, offshore teams sometimes don't communicate things really well. So you would say that that was kind of what really kept you going forward. Yeah. It was just above the above level. Yeah, and I knew, I mean, even now I'm sending stuff to Austin like, hey, I want to implement this. How much How much will this cost? Realistically, what, what will it cost? And I know I'm not going to get a fluff answer. Um, and so it helps me make decisions like, is this the right it. move now? Yep. Like, or can it wait or what, what's the best play? So, so let's, yeah. let's talk a little bit about like budget, right? And, and how those conversations went. Austin, you love these conversations. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's kind of an interesting, but like your expectations to what was delivered to conversations and communication, like, cause I, I think people just don't, and, and you, you hit on it really early in the morning or early in the early on in the conversation he said people are like i can get this built for 15k and you just kind of like laugh at it a little bit like no you're going to get a wireframe and that's about it yeah but let's talk about like those conversations you had in austin you can kind of touch on both sides here i'm just curious on how these conversations happen oh with budget to features to kind of mm -hmm. how that that happened i think one thing that's like super interesting is with every project and when we even tell like these new clients this now it's like hey we're going to give you an estimate but like be prepared because there's going to become a point where we're going to probably have to ask for more because we did not understand some something was going to take super long yep. and i think that's just like one thing 
that's like super hard to convey, but like always happens. And that's why we tell people if you're raising funding, it's like, we'll give you a budget, but you really should raise double. <laughs> like just to, just to prepare and prepare for, you know, worst case scenarios or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'd be super curious to kind of hear your take. Like, how did you, how did you make the decisions to like pivot and like keep going? Cause I think really as a founder, you've got two choices. You either keep investing or you stop. Um, so yeah, explain that to us. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, again, I was just fortunate, had a good career, still do, but had a really good run with, with Vivint. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, and knocking doors is nothing glamorous. I, I, yeah. I honestly don't think there's, we all know, <laughs> yeah, there's not a soul that, that, you know, knocking on someone's door. I mean, it's, it's a really looked down upon yeah. profession yep. and, and people are almost scared to tell people that's what they do for a living. Like it's, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, you know, but <laughs> I'm, a door -door salesman. I'm a professional door to door salesman. That guy that you brush off your porch, you know, like a straight cat is, that's what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I was able to have funds from doing that to be able to do, to do it. So, um, that wasn't that, difficult of a decision for me to like, do I want to do? I think at the beginning, going into it, no, if you're going to commit to it, you, you better commit to it. Like if not, that's how you lose money. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have this argument with not have it. I've had this argument with my wife uh, many times, right? It's, it was on different things, but one of them that I remember was, was so funny. She, she definitely sold me on it. And cause I've, I've sold her on things before, but, uh, but it was, you know, the, there's these purses that are really cheap. You can get really cheap purses at target or, or and then those are good. And she actually really likes those. Um, but if she was wanting to get a really expensive one, it was, well, these are cheap and this one's really expensive. However, this one is like proven to last for X number of years and these only last for one year, right? Mm -hmm. So if I buy, even though it's 10 times more of the cost, I'm gonna spend more on these cheap ones going through them and then breaking and having, I'll, I'll probably spend double on the cheap ones over the course of how long this will last. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you kinda gotta be ready to just be all in with it and do it right. Yeah. And Rather than doing a bunch of cheap ones. Yeah, half-assing it, you, you know, it's, it's never, never it, a good thing. It's super funny because I know we even wrote an article on it and it's like, yeah, you might be paying, you know, a firm, you know, somewhere between, you know, 150 and like 250 an hour or whatever to build your product. And it's like, I can go do this overseas at, for, you know, a hundred bucks an hour or way cheaper. And it's like, when you actually run like the analysis, like on the projects just in general, you typically see that the ones that aren't done right are just done overseas the wrong way typically costs double or triple. That's right. That's what I was going to say is doing it right the first time might be a little more money, mm -hmm. Up front. but yeah, but I think in the long run, it's a very easy argument to say it's actually cheaper. Yep. You know? Which, which I think everybody can relate to. Yeah. I think we all have something that we've done where we decided, like we have a friend who does everything as cheap as possible. And he always has to go back for the different contractor that like to do the floors or whatever. And I think that's something that's super, and I want you to hit on really, and you've done, um, is when you commit, you need to commit with the right person. And because like, if you commit with the wrong team, you could, it's hard for you to back out at that point, right? Sure. Because you're committed. But knowing, knowing that you have a budget, and you can trust that the budget isn't like a sales tactic to get as much money as we possibly can. It's more like, hey, we wanna get the best product we can within that budget, mm -hmm. really comes down to trust. And it's a hard thing that we run into often as a firm is we talk to people and we're like, hey, what do you have to budget towards this? And people always wanna give like, oh, not, they don't wanna tell us. The give me a quote. Yeah, I'm give like, me a quote. And it's like, we don't know, cause you didn't know how complicated that search feature was gonna be. Yeah. Like we could have said that was gonna take five hours and that thing took 50 hours. Yep. But if there's a sense of trust between the client and the, and the team, I feel like as long as that is communicated really well, 
I think everybody kind of wins in that situation. And we had a fun, one fun conversation where we actually like made a big pivot um, at the very end. And we literally sat down, had a big whiteboard and we're like, okay, what features do we need to launch with and what can we scrap? And I, I really enjoy those conversations because it really lets us like hone in on what the market really wants and lets us prioritize things. And I kind of want you to, I don't know if you remember that conversation. I don't, sorry. Oh no, that, that sucks. Because it was super, it was, it was super good because like we, we literally outlined, you know, in-app purchases are important or like these subscription things aren't important here or I don't know. Just a, yeah, just yeah. I think things. I remember. I think it was kind of getting to the point where I had I'm getting close to the funds that I want to spend in it initially. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, and so at that point, it's like, okay, if this is what I actually can spend mm -hmm. uh, remaining on this, and these are all the things that I want, now you're like, what is is for sure needed, and mm -hmm. what is nice, yep. you know? And the, the need to have, nice to have. So. Yeah, I think eventually you get to all of it, but mm -hmm. when, when we were deciding to launch, it was launch with what's needed, not, yep. not with what makes it the perfect app. And, and I, I, I was lucky because I, I have family that are involved in, I, I, the last video game I ever played was like Bond 007 on Nintendo's like Gold that one. Like that's <laughs> I'm not into video games. Yeah. Like odd job. Yeah. I could I care less. You know, it just it just never did it for me. And so uh, or even computers. I don't like computers. You oh, everybody you know, so. know he has a tech company and he didn't own a computer until like two months ago and I was like, you need to get a computer so you can see this. Just, my my phone does everything like that. <laughs> so <laughs> it <laughs> It's, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, yeah. This is like you started an app without owning a computer. He oh, went yeah. like eight months in and didn't have a computer. Yeah, they're like, pull it up on your laptop. I'm like, yeah. I, <laughs> so, I, I never needed one. So, but uh, kind of my family um, is really involved in that stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. My uncle is uh, very high up at, at Epic Games. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my cousins are some of the, the founders of you know, that Fortnite game or, mm. or whatever it is. So I was... <laughs> the one that does, you know, like 10 like billion a year. 10 billion a year. Super, <laughs> super popular. Um, yeah. I, yeah, that's a funny story. I, I was watching some of my friends play Fortnite when, when I was traveling in the summer. I think I was in Texas. And, and they were playing this game. And I was looking at it. I'm like, that looks really familiar. I think my cousins, like, made, made that game. Uh -huh. You know, and they're like, no way. It's like, you're probably right, but I'm pretty sure they, they did. Like, I remember seeing this. Um, but so anyway, I went to them, not, not my cousin, but my uncle, and just said, hey, what are your thoughts on not just this app, but give me some landmines to look out for, mm -hmm, you, yeah. you know? And, and he, was, he was like, just right off the bat, just no, you cannot make a bug-proof app. Like there is going to mm, be bugs. That is so important. There's going to be bugs and it will never stop. You, you'll, things will just like crash or get messed up without anyone touching anything. Yeah. It's just really weird. And, just then, technology. and then we found this is we would switch one thing, like not even related, <laughs> like how to log in. We switched the how to log in page uh, on the app. And then somehow like the sire filter went haywire <laughs> like completely unrelated thing <laughs> I, I remember we we came into this exact room probably eight months ago and you had to do one i remember what it was but you're like well if you click this then you click this and then it'll go through right <laughs> and i was like man that's so weird so like having those expectations up front saying listen you're gonna have bugs prepare for them yep. Yep. right and there's i mean you talk about the biggest tech companies in the world they have teams they spend hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars just managing bugs even the best products in the world Still have bugs. Facebook still has bugs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So like having that expectation. What are the bombs? Did he give me other like good bombs? Um, no. I mean, I'm sure he did. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of good advice. Um, yeah. But that was the that was the one that, that stuck out to one? me. Yeah. That that was the one I walked away from. Like I'm gonna remember that. So so we, we're running low on time. I'd say this is kind of we'll probably wrap up here soon. But I'm, I'm curious on because where you were when you had this idea and you knew it was a good idea to where you are now, what advice would you give to our listeners who are in a similar spot in that beginning? Like if you could go back in time and talk to Chris earlier, be like, hey, 
what would you tell them? And what would, and, and what would our listeners benefit from? Um, I don't know if it's, it's a deep it's, question. Yeah. I don't know if it's something that I learned and did wrong. I know for sure. One of them for me was I wanted to go into it, not thinking how much money I'm going to make on this. Like when, when you make anything in life and I, I think that's why, you know, money doesn't solve all problems and doesn't buy happiness, but it, it can get rid of a lot of problems. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You'll get new problems, but it gets rid of a lot of them. And I think when people make decisions, like if they feel like they're in a corner and they have to make decisions based on money, a lot of times you might make the wrong decision just because you're reacting to that need and that fear. And, you know, and so I, I know for a fact, if I was needing to make money and made the app and I had to generate money immediately, I would have made different decisions. Yep. You know, I, I would have done things that I think would actually have killed the app within the first 12 months. Yeah. And so it was, I'm Cause not, if you would have, if you would have a bar of entry, 20 bucks to sell a horse, things like that is what you're talking about. Yeah. I think it still would have worked, yeah, but it would have been, I was, I was looking at it. What's the best thing for, for this product? Like the user, the user what, what is the best move for them? Right? Not what's the best. Obviously you want to have what's the best for me, mm -hmm. but uh, not when I say me, the company, right? But what is the best for, for them? Like know who your customers are, right? And mm -hmm. so we made decisions based on that and it's, it's really helped. Yeah. But so probably that and then just the obvious of not knowing that you can't make a bug free app. Yep. Uh, and then, you know, also if no one's kind of gone down the path already, it, that was the thing that I learned that I didn't know is, you know, when you make an app on iOS, on Apple, you can't copy and paste that over to Android. Yep. It's not like, oh, they both work the same. You know? It's just like, oh, let's just launch it in the Google store too. Yeah, just put whatever, <laughs> whatever you paid to get the Apple app, you're gonna have to pay that exactly to make your Android app, yeah. right? So that was interesting and, <laughs> and I didn't know that. Uh, and so that, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. Like if people are so just starting out, like you, you do wanna know that. And, and I almost, I want to say uh, another thing that I've learned just from this is really trust your developer, whether it's obviously it's us, we're, we're developers and, and we've, you've worked with Austin and you trust him, but like no matter where you go, make sure there's probably a good level of trust and communication because it really can go sour really quick yeah. if, if that communication, and I feel like that's something that has made both very successful. I'd say, yeah, having trust um, and being experienced, knowing so if you're going to go with someone, see what they've made in the past and do you, cause obviously most of what apps are built are based on what that client was wanting. Right. And so don't hold them to like, this is all he can do. It's like, no, it's probably what, not probably, that is what the client wanted. Like, but did they do a good job? Yeah. Like, does it function correctly? Is it easy? Is um, it bug free? Yeah. Is it bug free? <laughs> so I'd say that having the trust of of your developer, as far as the dialogue is open, you know, you're not getting lied to. Um, I'd say that's probably more important than the experience because as long as someone is open, willing to do the right thing, make it right. That's better than having a, a overly experienced developer yeah. because yeah. you know that we'll get through it. Like yeah. we'll, we'll figure this We're thing out together. Yeah. So yeah, 100%. probably that. So I guess to kind of recap some of the biggest problems or like biggest issues that we made in the beginning w was first not understanding how complex like the searches or how robust the searches needed to be because we had to make them like performance so we can handle, you know, lots and lots of search searches concurrently or whatever else. Um, but then the next big thing was adding like location searching, which even to this day could probably be better. Yeah. Um, and one of the, basically the, the way that we solved that or the, um, the approach that we took is uh, this was like different because you were very specific on the you uh, user experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so normally what we would do is, what, what I wanted to do initially was to make it so when they go to create a horse, we could like search for a location, put a pin there and be done and it would be in that general vicinity. 
or we would use just the user's location and when they posted it, we would take that and, and post it there and then anybody could search. But you I, can already start to see like there would be problems in that approach. But what made it more complex is we are doing searches based on zip codes, mm -hmm. not just standard latitude and longitudes. And yeah. typically you would use a latitude and longitude to look up a zip code and not the reverse. And so we scraped the internet for a bunch of free solutions and instead of tr trying to pay, you know, hundreds, because it was going to be hundreds of dollars to integrate with these things, we basically went and scraped a ton of information from these like open source things and we built like our own. <laughs> because that was like literally the best thing that we could come up with unless you wanted to pay two to five hundred dollars a month. Um, but it, it's way harder when you have to use a zip code and then find latitude and longitude. And then take the user's location and find things around it. And well, the then, U.S. is huge. Yeah. yeah so uh, it's not we're not just searching in the U.S., but we're also uh, having to support can Canadian zip codes, and they're formatted different. They're I think they're both numbers and letters. And so well, not only that, but I mean, I know horse ranchers who their horse ranch is hundreds of miles away. Exactly. From where they live, right. Like I can post this horse here, but my horse ranch is you know 100 miles away. Exactly. And so that's what made a lot of that created a lot of difficulty. And so really just coming up with a solution that worked, not the best, but like works, <coughs> I want to say 75% of the time um, was where we got to. Yeah. But that was a huge pain in the ass. Yeah, and it, I was, because uh, some of the options that were thrown out to me that would be easier would be do it by state. Yeah. And I knew that wouldn't work because these other, like these other websites had that and it just, it wasn't good to use. It wasn't user friendly. And I, but then I think what ones are really good to use and what do people use? And it's like on Auto Trader or on Zillow, you can put in your zip and say this far from me or my current yes, location no. and yes, this many same. miles from, from where I'm at right now. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So I know like, just cause in, in the horse world, people will go to like ranches and if they didn't see what they want or whatever, They'll make trips to go view horses. So they're like, give me a 200 mile radius from here. So when I go out and start them. looking, then I'm going to go and hit yep. all these places, which is what we do for cars. You know, if I do a search of, of car that I want to buy, you know, I'll, I'll do this radius because I know, hey, if I go out on a Saturday, I want to go to these places and I don't want to drive, you know, from, I don't want to drive 500 miles to go look at a car it's just not a thing and but. and the big thing is we, i think here is like we wanted to stay lean we didn't want to pay two to five hundred dollars a yeah. month to try lost. and integrate with this thing especially where you weren't monetizing early mm -hmm. like we don't need expenses like that and so coming coming up with that solution was definitely a big win but a lot of work um yeah. i'm trying to think was there a third thing that just really sucked or was super hard what about going to transitioning to um auctions is that something you want to talk um about? the That's auctions still. wasn't Hard. Yeah, we got to get that better though. Oh, for you, yeah. Yeah, for, yeah, <laughs> for me, but yeah, easier for yeah. So again, always things to fix. Yep. yep. Um, auctions was something that we integrated later because it was like a lot of people do use auctions. Mm -hmm. However, and that just another problem that I saw. It's like the the only way that people view these listings on auctions are either web-based or it's like the book that they hand out before the auction, right? You're kind of flipping through it and reading. Mm -hmm. it's like, why can't someone just pull it up on their phone and, and see it the exact same way that we're viewing it, it you know, on, on all the other horses. So mm -hmm. it just, it's just widening the net of people that can, can use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so basically one other thing that was interesting that came up was being able to like enlarge and, and click like a video just because of the format that we had it in. So one thing that, um, you'll notice is it's a pretty common standard for the videos you view on iOS are going, should also be visible on Android. Uh, but there's actually like, um, basically a like rotation and format change that you have to make before you can do that. Uh, <laughs> and that was like kind of a pain as well. Yeah. Um, and we also wanted to do like a lot of like limiting on like video length and trying to make that clear to the user. I mean, those, those were problems that weren't necessarily overly complex to heart, but just took a lot of like time and effort to get right mm -hmm. and, and to get like performant. So I guess one big thing that we struggled with at the beginning uh, for listings was being able to batch upload photos and videos at the same time and not have the user wait two minutes. Yeah, it, it all, the reason we decided it was again, just user experience. Yeah. I wanted the user experience to be 
exactly how I wanted it, right? Yeah. I knew what would work. And so the, the problem is when we were trying to upload multiple videos on that, like on, on Auto Trader, KSL, or, or whatever it is, or Zillow, you want to see a home and they do like a video viewing of the house, like that's good. But in horses, it's more, it's important because yeah. you have pictures, but how does that horse actually ride? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. is, it, is it athletic enough? Can it do the maneuvers I want it to do? So it was a big part of it, but I definitely did not want someone, it, and it was crazy how long it would take, but you list a horse and you have like 10 videos on there that are like a minute each mm -hmm. and, and you hit list. I mean, it was, it could have taken 15 minutes, which mm -hmm. doesn't seem like a long time, but if you're just sitting there waiting for something Trying to load, keep your fold from locking it, and stuff. It is, like it's a long time. And I'm like this, okay, this won't work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's limit it to however many videos and how the lengths of them so that it is getting done, you know, at a, at a minute, minute and a half max. Mm -hmm. So, but then I did want them to be able to show their horses, like the, mm -hmm. the full videos of whatever they're wanting. So. Then we just, so we added in a place where people could add a, a link URL. to their video. YouTube yeah, so yeah. It, there was a workaround that didn't interrupt the user experience. Yeah, right? and it seems like it was pretty affordable. Like yeah. that just putting in the YouTube link rather than trying to change the bandwidth and things like that. Yeah, and, and basically what we ended up doing to really speed it up was obviously like compressing the video, changing the format, because we had to do that for Android. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, yeah, adding like YouTube links. And I think we also have like a couple of retries as well in case something does fail. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the upload process, it, when you're dealing with 10, 15 high resolution images and high resolution uh, vi uh, videos is tough because a lot of these videos are shot like 4K. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's, nice it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, awesome. Well, no, Chris, thanks for jumping on. Like it's been a lot of fun. Tell us, tell our listeners, Listen, where do they go to find a horse if they want to sure. buy, sell? Yeah, it's just the app is Equine Trader. Um, we have a website, equinetrader.com. Equine Trader is one word. So, um, one word or two? One word. One word. Biggest pet peeve. <laughs> 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 so yep. One word. One Equine word. Trader. Yeah, just search wherever you buy apps. You know, Equine Trader, it's on there. Um, yeah, or you can go to the website and there's a direct link on there to take you to download the app. So, um, but yeah, it's 100% free to use. Doesn't cost anything to download it. Doesn't cost anything to sell, list. There's no fee that's taken. Like it's just, it's 100% free to use. And so it, it can get kind of addicting if you're into horses. I have people come up to me and they're like, I spend hours on that thing. Cause it's just. Oh, I have family that does. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> you're searching and it's just, it just kind of becomes fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Even yeah. if you're not in the market to buy, it's still like, if you have a passion for horses, people, like I know that my sister's not trying to, but at least her husband won't let her buy another horse. But she's she's just on it all the time. She yep. tells me all the time, so yep. it's pretty cool. So yeah, so so equine trader, one word. One uh, word. Download the app. If you find a bug, just send lots of emails about. Send it. it. Send it to Austin. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for thanks for jumping. Yeah, on. appreciate. It.